In September 1983, the Polish Pope, John Paul II, came to this church to pray. He did so because almost exactly 300 years earlier to the day, on the 11th of September, 1683, a regiment of Polish hussars also gathered at this same spot to offer prayers. It was the eve of a tremendous battle between two great armies. On the one hand, the military might of the Muslim Ottoman Empire, and on the other, an alliance of Christian forces from across Europe, in which the Polish contingent would play a pivotal role. The battle, which commenced in the early hours of the following morning, would come to be seen as one of the defining moments in European history, the after effects of which continue to reverberate to this day. The Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453 was a devastating blow to Christian Europe. From an insignificant tribe of Turkic nomads, fired up by the flavor of Islam, the people of Osman had transformed themselves into a great imperial power. With Constantinople, rechristened Istanbul, as their capital, the Ottomans stood on the threshold of a golden era, largely brought about by the vision of one man. Sultan Suleiman I, known by many as Suleiman the Magnificent. In 1520, Suleiman inherited a sprawling empire that stretched from the borders of Hungary in the northwest to Crimea in the northeast and across the Levant into Egypt. Suleiman was one of the greatest uh, Ottoman sultans. He was a very intelligent man and a very ambitious man. And he had huge resources on his side. He brought uh, um, the Ottoman Empire to the height of, of, of civilization. He did a lot of building projects, mosques, uh, bathhouses, social institutions. We know that he sponsored the production of loads of beautiful art and artworks. Um, when people went to visit him, they described him sitting on cloths of gold and wearing a ruby the size of a hazelnut with a pearl the size of a hazelnut dangling from his ear. So he was a man who obviously enjoyed the good things of life. Solomon's nickname was Solomon the Lawgiver. What he did was get the administration and the legal structure of this vast and expanding territory working well. One of Suleiman's greatest achievements was to bring stability and prosperity to a vast and culturally diverse empire. To get an idea of daily life during Suleiman's time, I'm visiting the tiny village of Jumaliksik, here in northern Anatolia. Unchanged for hundreds of years, this is about as close as you can get to travelling back in time. Before film, TV, and of course the internet, shadow puppet theatre was the number one entertainment across the empire. <laughs> Following time-honoured plots and characters, the plays offer a unique insight into the nature of Ottoman society. I'm watching this one with Ugo Jeliko, who comes from a long line of Turkish puppeteers. <laughs> Karagos and Hajivat are the main characters of the play. Karagos uh, represents somebody in the street, and, and Hajivat is uh, an educated man. So these two men, first of all, are organizing all these funny things. In this play, for example, Karagos and Hajivat are in collaboration in order to earn money, so they put up a swing, and Hajivat sends different characters to Karagos. Well, were there kind of regional differences? I mean, was there a special kind of theatre for the Balkans? Well, I think it was 
almost the same throughout the empire, but as you know, the Ottoman Empire started growing and many different nationalities were living together. As a result of that, we can see Albanians, we have Greek characters, we have Arabs, we have Kurdish, we can see a Jewish character, for instance. We have all these different nationalities and characters. Here we have the tax collector, and he is uh, the Ottoman official. The whole place is going really funny, but right in the middle of everything, he says, don't forget to pay your tax. <laughs> the theatre must have performed a very valuable role as, as a sort of safety valve for letting off steam, and also for actually changing things around. I think so. It was like a television. People were getting news from there. A puppeteer can speak about everything, even he can criticize the governmental system, the sultan himself. So I think that's very important, and maybe this is something we don't have today. One secret of the success was the tolerance. There was no pressure on turning Christian populations into uh, Muslims, because uh, Christians did pay higher taxes than Muslims. Ethnicity is not important. As long as you paid your taxes, nobody is going to interfere with you because of your religious beliefs. The Ottoman government was effective. It was, by and large, less oppressive of the ordinary common people than the previous Christian governments had been. For the ordinary people, life was OK. In spite of the empire's stability, Suleiman was bent on expansion. But a formidable rival was emerging in Europe that would complicate his plans, the Habsburg King Charles V. Appointed Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope in 1519, Charles presided over a vast territory, including Spain and its emergent American colonies, the Netherlands, and swathes of Germany, Italy, Austria, and Hungary. As the two leaders prepared for war, the scene was set for a clash of egos and ambitions that would play out on an epic scale. Charles V and Suleiman the Magnificent were intense rivals. This was, in some respects, a grudge match between neighbours. I'm not sure if Suleiman regarded Charles V as a worthy rival, because during the reign of Charles V, they never accepted the Habsburg emperors as equal. The Ottomans believed that they had the title of Caesar. They were inheritors of the Roman emperor, and Charles also claimed that title. So there was a grudge as to who had this title, really. So it was kind of personal. Charles V had some ideas of a crusade. You still had the idea of the Reconquista in Spain, so you could fight Islam and with the help of God, you would be victorious. Charles staged an elaborate coronation of himself as Holy Roman Emperor, the Caesar. A huge display, really, to show Suleiman that he had this title. And Suleiman actually responded by having an elaborate gold helmet made for himself in Venice, which the Venetians claimed belonged to Alexander the Great. They were very good at selling fake jewellery to people, and staging his own celebrations. So there's a great propaganda war going on for both sides, really. In 1521, Suleiman made his first move in Europe by taking the city of Belgrade on the fringes of the Habsburg Empire. But Suleiman had a much bigger prize in his sights, Vienna, a key city in the heart of the eastern half of Charles's Holy Roman domains. Known as the Golden Apple, Vienna was the gateway to Central Europe, and its capture would not only open the door to further European incursions, but deliver a powerful blow to Habsburg hegemony in the region. Success, however, would require patience and a strategy. Suleiman had both. 
Solomon is looking for allies against the Habsburgs, and the natural ally is the King of France. France was surrounded by Habsburg territories. They really felt menaced by this overwhelming power. And it's a very old political trick. The enemy of your enemy is my friend. The French and the Ottomans agreed trade treaties, uh, which allowed the French uh, a presence in Istanbul and the ability to trade. The quid pro quo for this is the French give Suleiman the use of ports in the south of France from which to raid the Mediterranean, and this does a great deal of damage. And there are times when the Ottomans are using cannonballs with the fleur de, fleur de lis on them. It helped also Suleiman in weakening the Habsburgs because the Habsburgs could never concentrate on one frontier. They could not concentrate all their troops to fight the Turks because at the same time they had campaigns against the French. The perfidious alliance of the 16th century, as it was called, which is a scandal of Europe, made life harder for the Habsburgs. At the same time, the Protestant Reformation was sweeping across Christian Europe, affording Suleiman further divisions to exploit. The Ottomans saw the Protestants as being natural allies, and they did make overtures to the Protestants of Northern Europe. After uh, England becomes a Protestant country, um, there were overtures made uh, on the basis that uh, Spain is now England's enemy and Elizabeth sent ambassadors and gifts to the Ottoman sultans. A woman called Safiye, who's in the Ottoman court, writes to Elizabeth I and says, oh, I hear you make these really beautiful perfumes and ointments and makeup. Can I get some of your English makeup? So it's this fantastic moment where you have high politics in action and something very, very female as well. A lot of Protestant uh, rulers or noblemen preferred an Ottoman rule than a Habsburg Catholic rule because of tolerance. If you had to pay higher taxes to the Ottomans or being burned on the stake, you preferred higher taxes. But what we see here really is Europe breaking down from a pan-Christian front that all, all, the, the crusading idea has died and people are now nation states. And so the deals that they're making are in their personal national interests. Keen to exploit European disunity, Suleiman initiated his plan of attack by taking on the defiant kingdom of Hungary. Allied with Austria, it was the one obstacle that stood between him and Vienna. As Suleiman and his armies crossed the Danube, a Habsburg Hungarian force rallied to meet them here, outside the tiny village of Mohac in southern Hungary. What became known as the Battle of Mohac would be a national tragedy for Hungary that reverberates to this day. Twenty-five years of misrule by a weak and ineffectual king had left Hungary divided. The peasants were in near revolt, the aristocrats, they were fighting amongst each other. The incoming king, Louis II, he was just 19 years of age and he was inexperienced in the art of statecraft and military campaigning. He managed to raise a fighting force of 30,000 men, but that was just half the number of the Ottoman force. The field of the battle is memorialized here in this rather strange and disquieting monument. The terrible battle that ensued is seared into the Hungarian collective consciousness. The Hungarian forces were no match against the superior might of Suleiman's armies. And within just a few hours of the battle's commencement, they were destroyed. In a final tragic twist, the young Hungarian King Louis, while attempting to flee to safety, was thrown from his horse and died. Mohac was the moment that shattered Hungary. It's remembered by the Hungarians almost in the same way that Kosovo is remembered by the Serbians. It forms a moment of grief, of mourning, of national lament. The Battle of Mohac is 
absolutely fundamentally here because in one battle, Hungary is effectively knocked out of the equation. The Battle of Mohac was a tragedy for Hungary, but a resounding victory for the Ottomans. Suleiman now controlled the southern half of the kingdom, providing him with a strong base for further campaigns into Habsburg territory. And just three years later, his armies were on the move again. In the summer of 1529, they swept northward, capturing the Hungarian capital, Buda, and by September, they were outside the gates of Vienna itself. It was an audacious act that took the city by surprise. Vienna was very ill-prepared for this siege. It still had a medieval fortress. It had not too many troops in it. And the Turkish army was enormous. It was about 200,000 men. From their headquarters in St. Stephen's Cathedral, the Viennese commanders looked on in horror as the Ottomans began to bombard their city. The defenders, for their part, put up a heroic resistance and they kept the Turkish army at bay for several weeks. But there was a limit to how long they could hold out. Defeat seemed inevitable. Until, at the 11th hour, fortune came to them in the form of bad weather. Torrential rain and early snowfall forced the Ottomans to abandon the siege. According to some defenders, divine providence had favoured the Christians. Heaven helped the Viennese. It was pouring rain. The Turkish army would have been smaller, maybe Vienna would have fallen. But you had to feed 200,000 men and 100,000 beasts. And this by very bad roads, uh, mud, uh, great difficulties in supply lines. The problem for the Ottomans really was it took 100 days to get to Vienna. And this is always at the outer limit of what they could achieve. Um, uh, and in 1529, they uh, left too late in May. They didn't reach there till September. It rained all the way up. And, um, it, and it snowed early. So their wind of opportunity when they got there was, was, was short, really. The failure of the first siege of Vienna was more important than the siege of Vienna. It's not the siege itself which really surprised people or surprised so many people. It was the fact that the Ottomans failed. They had been stopped. After the first siege and his failure in Vienna, Suleiman did become obsessed with Vienna because Vienna did become more important. And because of this uh, uh, reinforcement of the importance of Vienna, for Suleiman it becomes a more important aim to conquer Vienna again. Suleiman's failure to take Vienna proved at least one thing, that the Ottoman military machine was not invincible. And the Viennese, along with half of Europe, breathed a hefty sigh of relief. But Suleiman was nothing if not determined, and over the next 25 years, he made at least one further attempt to take the city. But this time, he didn't even get there. His armies were bogged down in Hungary, stalled by bad weather and the defiant resistance of the Hungarians. It seemed that Suleiman's dream of plucking the golden apple from its bough was doomed. But his resolve was undiminished. Suleiman the Magnificent would take Vienna or die trying. It wasn't until the summer of 1566 that Suleiman, at the ripe old age of 72, would assemble the largest Ottoman army to date and set off in the direction of Vienna once again. What was interesting was that Suleiman went on campaign. He hadn't been on campaign for uh, I can't remember, I prefer a decade. And suddenly, at the end of his life, he feels a need to go out there and show his face to the troops, really. And I read that as being something significant about uh, his, uh, his presence or lack of presence in, uh, in the public eye. Suleiman was very old to go to a campaign, but he believed that he himself is the 
ultimate commander. Um, he, his, he, he should lead his army. And so he felt himself as being a soldier as, as a center of his meaning as a ruler. Crossing the Danube, Suleiman's forces descended on the relatively insignificant fortress town of Sigurdvar. It should have been an easy victory, but Sigurdvar had been a thorn in the Ottoman side for decades, resisting capture time and time again, which prevented previous campaigns from reaching Vienna. At the center of its defense was a well-fortified citadel. In Suleiman's mind, it was time this annoying molehill was leveled. But few could have predicted at the outset of the siege the extraordinary events that were about to unfold. Events that would see the little town of Sigurdvar go down as the stuff of legend. With less than 3,000 soldiers, Sigurdvar was no match for Suleiman's forces. But it did have some advantages. Surrounded by a lake, the town was laid out across three fortified islands. The Ottomans managed to take the first two islands relatively quickly, forcing the surviving townsfolk and soldiers to take refuge in the citadel. With only 300 soldiers remaining, the defender's Croatian commander, Miklos Rinyi, faced an impossible task. To get a Hungarian take on this legendary battle, I'm meeting author and journalist Cecilia Hazai. Cecilia, these are pretty impressive fortifications. Tell me something about their arrangement, how they worked. See, what you see today is not what it once was. Imagine it was surrounded by a huge lake. The Ottomans, when they arrived here, they started drying this whole water up. It took them a good two and a half, three weeks before they could actually start attacking the fort. Tell me what happened next. Uh, the Turks uh, fired uh, into the fort and a massive fire broke out because they, they actually attacked their uh, artillery equipment. So this fire was burning, hope was dying. So the only way for the Hungarian defenders was to break out of the fort and sacrifice their lives. They talked about it, they prepared for it, Mentally, they dressed up, prayed, and just opened the gates and charged out of the fort to certain death. Zrini was shot twice, and the Turks swiftly grabbed him, put him over a cannon, and beheaded him. It's obviously a, a very heroic, if kind of gruesome, death for Zrini. Absolutely, but the Hungarian boys left a nice little surprise for the Ottomans because they knew they would charge into the fort. So they stuffed this one room with a bunch of explosives. The Ottoman soldiers came into uh, the fort, or what remained of it, opened this room, and this just blew up and thousands died. And of course, Suleiman himself had died that very same morning. Yes, but nobody knew about it. Uh, they had to keep it secret. Uh, if the soldiers, the Ottoman soldiers, find out that the Sultan has died, looting, rebellion, you can imagine what happens. They managed to keep it secret for over two weeks. They had him buried quickly. It was still summer, it was warm, you know. Dead body rots uh, in half an hour. They uh, took the heart out, as well as some inner organs. And legend has it that they put it in some golden bowl and buried that separately. Suleiman's army captured Zigurdfar, but at a price. Not only had they suffered enormous losses, but their sultan had died. Not in battle, but of illness. The push to Vienna was abandoned. Suleiman's dream left unfulfilled. It's a kind of melancholy conclusion to Suleiman's life. Almost the last words in his journal are, smoke is still coming from the chimneys of Sigetvar, and that, that he dies trying to conquer this, this tiny little place, which is only defended by 2,000 people, and almost like a failure. It sort of represents a failure of the conquest project. But the story doesn't end there. 
Searches for a tomb containing Suleiman's heart and that mythical golden cup have occupied Turkish and Hungarian authorities and treasure seekers for centuries. Despite many excavations and false claims, no one has been able to locate it until now. Recent excavations in the back garden of this Sigurdvar suburb look promising. So I'm meeting archaeologist Erika Hans on site to see what's been found. Erika, you're responsible for this very big hole in the ground. And it looks like you've uncovered some really interesting stuff. Yes, uh, we are in a very interesting place now. It is from the 16th century, and we can say that uh, it was built by the Turks, and after the Turks were leaving the uh, place, uh, it disappeared. It is a rectangular building uh, yeah. with an entrance uh, right. at the other side, and this building uh, faces to Mecca. So, probably a mosque. Yes, we are thinking that it is a mosque. We can say that uh, this uh, mosque belonged to the tomb of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Really? You think oh, yeah? so? People have been looking for this for, for centuries, perhaps. Yeah? So that means his tent was also located at the site. This is where his encampment was. Yes, uh, because according to the written sources, uh, he was uh, uh, buried in exactly that place where he died and mm. where uh, his uh, tent was. Right. OK, well, the story goes that, um, that when they disemboweled him, they put his insides into a golden receptacle and then built this tomb over the top. Have you found any evidence of this wonderful treasure? Uh, yes, we had excavation, but unfortunately, we didn't find that golden cup. But according to my opinion, it wasn't any golden cups at all, because according to the Islamic traditions, the buried bodies or inner organs should mix with the Mother Nature. So that's why the Golden Cup legend cannot be true. Right. A bit of a shame. I was hoping I might get lucky. Suleiman may have failed to capture Vienna, but he is widely regarded as the empire's most successful sultan. During his 46-year rule, he expanded Ottoman territory on every front, absorbing Tunisia and Algeria and North Africa, and consolidating gains in Hungary, Romania and Moldavia. He pushed east into the Caucasus, beyond the Black Sea, and in the Middle East secured Iraq and the holy Islamic cities of Mecca and Medina. Suleiman's legacy was far-reaching, not only in the Middle East, but also across Europe, and in particular Vienna, where many artifacts of the period can still be found. I'm visiting Vienna's imperial armory with Matthias Waffenbichler, who's also its curator, to explore some of the city's most prized treasures from Suleiman's time. This looks like a very sort of Turkish, what I imagine Turkish helmets to be like. No, they are not. They are just European, made in South Germany. It was made for the Austrian nobility. They used to have mock battles where half of the nobility was disguised as Christian and the other half as Turks. When you say mock battles, I mean, was this some kind of spectacle? I mean, were there spectators yes, watching? The, spectators watching, the whole court watching. So it was like part a like a tournament, yeah, right. like a chance. But it was dangerous, very dangerous. Therefore, they had um, visors in the form of Turkish faces. This is a visor I can show you, yeah. if you look. So you exchange the rice on your helmet with this, and through these holes you can look. It's heavy uh, and solid metal. And if you, if you look, you can see quite a lot if you look through this. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a surprisingly good field of vision considering the narrow slits, but I'm not sure I'd like to be behind this mask for long. This is the Saba of Suleiman. You see, here is his Tugra. All right, that, that's this is the stamp with yeah. his uh, name. It's remarkably small and insignificant, yes, really. Yes, if you're a ruler who rules three continents and is so powerful, he doesn't have to show off. This is made out of what? It's made of leather. Leather, right. And, and this is silver, silver. Yeah. and steel. Right. This is a very practical weapon. You can draw it, and it could have killed anybody. Yes, yeah, it looks exceedingly but Normally, a commander-in-chief doesn't come in the opportunity of killing anybody. He has men who do this. Yeah. 
How does it come to be here? I mean, was it captured in battle or something like that? No, um, at the time we, we never did win a, a battle against Suleiman himself. The Austrians had an embassy in Istanbul and it was one of the tasks of the ambassadors to try to get objects for the Habsburg family. And, and would the, the Austrian emperor, would he be, be handing out things like this himself or not? Uh, the Austrian emperor would send presents to the Turks, yes, yeah. a lot of clocks, clocks. maybe not swords, but right. clocks, right. Uh, pistols right. would go as a present yeah. to the Turks. So you say this was a gift. Um, there, were, there were exchanges between them, that they were enemies? The idea that these two empires always wage war is wrong. Uh, there were enemies for some time, but they had very long peace periods because it was much cheaper for both empires. Uh, after the death of Suleiman, they uh, negotiated an amnesties, and this lasted for more than 40 years. Any enduring peace between the Ottomans and the Habsburgs was doomed to fail. By the late 17th century, circumstances and key players had changed, bringing renewed zeal on both sides. Spurred on by the enthusiastic support of Pope Innocent XI, the conflict was once again cast as a religious struggle. The Pope was much um afraid of the Ottomans, a bit like now we are afraid of ISIS. The Habsburg used this religious implication to organize support. On the Ottoman side, the new Sultan, Mehmed IV, and his Grand Vizier, Kara Mustafa, became obsessed with capturing Vienna. But their motives were complex. By the time we get to the 17th century, the rhetoric of holy war is still being used by the Ottomans, but it's kind of a bit more measured by this time. It's more imperial. The grudge match is still going on with the Habsburg dynasty, and that this is a place, this obsessive return to this place that is just beyond reach, really, that will um, legitimize um, uh, an, an empire which is starting to fall behind. When Karim Mustafa came to power, he had one great disadvantage. He was not a professional general. He was a courtier. So he wanted to prove to all these great generals who came from the Janitor Corps that he's as good as they are. And so he wanted to conquer something which was very prestigious, which was Vienna. In the summer of 1683, Kara Mustafa and an Ottoman army of several hundred thousand set off from Edirne to capture Vienna. It would become the largest army to have ever besieged a European city. As news of the Ottoman advance reached Vienna, panic swept across the city. Tens of thousands evacuated, including reigning Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I and his family. The task of defending the city fell to seasoned Viennese Field Marshal Ernst Rudiger von Starenberg. He was faced with a formidable logistical challenge. It was a little over one and a half centuries since Suleiman had laid siege to Vienna. And in the intervening years, the Viennese had completely upgraded their defenses. They rebuilt the city walls, incorporating the laces, advances in military engineering. This is one of the last surviving sections of those walls. But even at the moment of their completion, they were redundant. The art of warfare had moved on, and the rules of engagement had changed completely. So, in spite of the evident sturdiness of these great city walls, Vienna was really in no position to withstand a full frontal attack by the might of the Ottoman army. On July the 14th, 1683, the watchmen of Vienna looked out from their perch atop St. Stephen's Cathedral. The Ottomans had the city surrounded, a vast army the like of which few Viennese had ever seen. 
The battle commenced with a thunderous cannonade directed at the city walls. But many of the cannonballs also flew into the heart of the city, bringing down church spires. For the faithful praying for salvation below, it was a hellish din, the sound of Armageddon. As the bombardment raged above ground, a strange subterranean campaign was unfolding beneath the city. The Ottomans had hundreds of sappers who built a network of trenches which enabled them to move the infantry and the artillery close up to the city walls. The trenches were effective to a point, but if they got too close to the fortifications, the men inside would be sitting ducks open to fire from the parapets above. So the sappers dug tunnels deep underground in an effort to reach the foundation of the city walls. Once there, they would plant explosives to bring the walls down. These Ottoman sappers were real professionals. Many of them were recruited from the Serbian mines, so they knew a thing or two about digging holes and laying explosives. And they could work really fast with great precision, which would take them under the city walls. It was a curious kind of subterranean warfare waged in the dark, but it could prove devastating when it came off. The sappers posed tremendous problems for Vienna's defenders, but there was a way to counteract them, and it lay deep beneath the city, in a labyrinthine network of underground cellars and passageways. Local guide Peter Harbiger is showing me a section of the old tunnels that runs beneath a bakery in the heart of the city. These tunnels, as you can see here, played an important role in the time of the Ottoman siege because we are now here very close to the city's fortifications. And the idea was to sit down here and listening if some counter digging of the Ottoman miners uh, could be heard here down in the cellar. So you said the Viennese were down here in these tunnels yep. listening. So yep. they just press their ears to the wall? Or? No, they had special measures, uh, special methods, for example, drums. They were placed here in front of the wall with dry peas on it. Peas? Peas, yeah, they were dry peas, and they were on the, on the surface of the drum. And when there was a digging, when the Ottoman miners started the digging and the, and the mines blasting, then suddenly the peas began to rattle. Right. Okay. And the rattling, uh, the rattling of the peas indicates there's someone coming. Okay, so they, they know there's someone out there so, coming through yeah. the earth. What do so, they do next? Yeah, they started there digging from the inside of the wall so, so they could, could find the, the Ottoman miners and they could defeat them and kill them in there. So, I mean, it means what we see here is behind mm -hmm. the brick facing of the tunnel yeah. and we're, we're into solid rock. Yeah. So very difficult to penetrate. It was a hard through. work. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. They used gunpowder. Yes. Uh, uh, to, to get in there. So there always the, the danger that something might, might happen, yeah, yeah. some shooting, some both fire, sides, some explosion, maybe up. the tunnel crushing down. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it must be a tremendous uh, situation down there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what you've described is this hellish scenario. Yeah. I mean, yeah. confined space, these tunnels that they were building were narrow yeah. Yeah. and dirt and just the flickering flames. And yeah. then suddenly you meet your enemy face to face you underground, underground and you kill them. Yeah. So we have a very famous legend here in Vienna, and it tells us the story of a young uh, baker boy uh, who was working down here because we are now here in the cellar of a bakery. And uh, he was working during the night, three o'clock in the morning, as bakers usually do. And he was the first, he was standing here, we have these drums with the piece on, and he heard the drums, he heard the rattling of the drums, right. so he knew there's danger coming. He was the first, and he, was, he gave alarm and said, alarm, they are coming. And so later on, the bakers were honored for, for this reason because they help the city. And uh, it, this story is, is told to every ch child and every day in school, for example. Yeah. So it's a very famous one. And we like it because it's a nice idea yeah. being saved by a baker boy. Baker boys, yeah. yeah, right, exactly. The Ottomans bombarded the city, both above and below ground, for two months. 
Despite their best efforts, the defenders couldn't hold out for much longer. The writing was all over the city's crumbling walls. Without a game changer, Vienna was doomed. The Turkish were able to almost conquer one of the bastions and destroy a second bastion. The last wall was one day or two days before it would have been breached. So it was very, very close. Salvation, if it were to come, would be riding a horse. Long-awaited relief forces were heading to Vienna, and among them was one of the most accomplished and respected cavalry in Europe, the Polish Hussars. Under the command of King John Sobieski, the Hussars were renowned for their bravery and horsemanship in battle. Today, they're still a source of great pride in Poland, and the Living History Reenactment Group of GNU are dedicated to keeping their legacy alive. But before we see them in action, I'm getting a lesson in 17th century Polish warfare. Well, I'm here with Jarek and his hussars. And Jarek, I want to go back 300 years to the eve of the Battle of Vienna. So turn me into a hussar, please. We will have to prepare you for yes. the battle. Christian Župan. The name of this part is Župan. The Hussars' uniform was built for speed and versatility. Their armour, weighing roughly 15 kilos, was actually considered lightweight for its day. So I feel like a lobster there. Maneuverability was essential for the range of weaponry used. And now I would like to give you the most beautiful yeah. weapon of all Polish noble. Polish sabre. For those higher-ranking soldiers, like me, Animal pelts were worn, and of course, a solid piece of headgear. How do you feel? Very encumbered. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, how can you fight like this? I can't yeah. move my head. <laughs> Firstly, you will have to practice with the pistols. Yes. And this was carried on the side of the horse. Yeah. 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 So you only really have one shot? Yeah, yeah. only one. Yeah. If you've got two pistols, yeah. Yeah, two, two shots. shots. Yeah. <laughs> so we can try. Okay, so, um, mm -hmm. so right, uh, yeah. right, I better not point at mm -hmm. anybody. Yeah. And I would just, mm -hmm. wow, great, like that. Yeah. But the Hussars' most important weapon was the lance. With some of the longest lances ever used in battle, the Hussars were feared for their terrifying charges. And now I would like to give to your hands the Queen of Polish Hussaria, the Polish lance. Right. And the length of this? About six meters long. Right. Do it. Okay. The right hand is for the lance, the left for the horse. For the horse, yeah. yeah. Well. Do you feel the power of Polish army? <laughs> I, I feel the weakness in my right arm. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious about spiking the enemy through. I mean, okay, so we've got one experience yeah. in 16. 60, yeah. during the Battle of Polanka, yeah. one Polish hussar spiked yeah. six soldiers. On his lance? On his lance. Ah, can be, he must be very strong to carry six <laughs> men. They're all on the lance of yeah. the same, yeah. like, like a kebab. Yeah. Without <laughs> onion. <laughs> By early September, Sobieski and his hussars reached the outskirts of Vienna, where they joined a large force of Habsburg armies drawn from other parts of the empire. As the city walls were beginning to crumble, the relief force sprang into action. Time was of the essence, and the Habsburg relief force needed to engage their enemy at the very first opportunity. And so it was decided that they would launch their attack on the Ottoman encampment from these heavily wooded hills to the west of the city, the Wienerwald. But it was a risky strategy, because in order to reach the summit, they had to pass through dense forests and along narrow ravines, which could have been disastrous had they been ambushed. But Karim Mustafa was so engrossed with his siege of the city, his focus was on Vienna, that he completely neglected to consider the possibility of an attack from without. And so the relief forces were able to gain the higher ground unopposed. Spreading out across the hilltops northwest of Vienna, the Habsburg relief armies were able to gain a commanding view of the enemy 
and the bombardment of the city below. And a pretty daunting sight it must have seemed as well, with a vast Ottoman host encamped in the valley surrounding Vienna, and a constant cannonade of Ottoman artillery blasting away at walls, billows of smoke rolling up the hills. And this is where the main army had to come down, descending through vineyards and crossing stony ground, and then at the bottom, the Ottomans. OK, they may not have been prepared for this attack, but when they were there, there was a huge army of soldiers waiting to meet the relief force. But then, further along the ridge, was King Sobieski's Polish hussars, and they were going to charge down a valley and attack the Ottoman host from the flank. And this was going to be a game changer. On the night of September the 11th, 1683, King Sobieski and his hussars came to the site of St. Joseph's Church, here in the hills overlooking Vienna, to pray before commencing their attack. The Poles were staunch Catholics, loyal to the Pope, defenders to their dying breath of Christendom and the Holy Roman Empire. For them, this was a conflict between the forces of good and evil, whose outcome could only be decided by God. The bulk of Habsburg forces made the first assault from the hills to the north of the city. As Kara Mustafa rallied his troops to meet them, the Polish hussars made their move. Reaching a valley to the southwest, they began their terrifying charge directly into the rear of the Ottoman encampment. Panic spread amongst the Ottoman troops who were unprepared for the double-pronged attack. As for Kara Mustafa, realizing the disaster unfolding before him, he retreated in disarray. His armies, overwhelmed by the surprise attack, followed closely behind. In an astonishing act of bravery, not least on the part of the Polish hussars, Vienna was saved. Karl Mustafa made a lot of mistakes because he was not a trained soldier. He didn't concentrate all his troops in defending uh, his um, camp against the assaulting uh, relief army, but continued the assault to the city because it was so close for the fall. So he divided his force which was technically a mistake. From the sumptuous interior of the Grand Vizier's tent, King Sobieski penned letters of the triumphant victory for the leaders of Europe. His immortal words, inspired by Julius Caesar, came to define the victory for Christendom. We came, we saw, God conquered. For most Europeans, this was a defining moment. Christianity had prevailed, and Europe had been saved from the infidel Turk. This was the rhetoric of churchmen and princes, but it was also a popular sentiment. Good had triumphed over evil. It was divine providence. They had God on their side. I think this is a watershed moment. There was a great deal of rejoicing throughout Europe as far away as Barcelona and England and so on. It also really put the Austrians on the front foot. The second siege didn't unite Christian Europe, but it helped enormously the prestige of the Austrian Empire. In their hasty retreat, the Ottoman army left behind a wealth of artifacts. And you can find many of them on display here in the Vienna Museum. To get a better understanding of the battle, I'm visiting the museum with historian Matthias Waffenbichler. This is very interesting because those are horse tails and they are signs of command for high-ranking Turkish commanders. The number of horse tails would tell the people his rank. How would these have been carried? Would it have been a, yes, a standard on the horse? On the horse. Yes. On the horse. Right, oh, yeah. oh, so. mm -hmm. This looks a very intriguing device with lots of spikes. It looks like some terrible weapon, but perhaps it's not. No, no, it, it's, it's no weapon. Uh, the spikes are just to hold some inflammable material around yes. it. So you can easily ignite it, and it's uh, a signal post. And then you can inflame it, and it gives a fire. Right. If there's a fire, everybody has to rush yes. through his cannons. 
These lances over here, they, yeah, they, they're very nice, they're beautifully decorated. They were recovered from the field of battle. Yes, they were recovered from the field of battle because the Turkish cavalry fled in panic and they left these wonderful lances and it was the Polish who started plundering the camp. Even before the battle was resolved? Was finished, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. because for everybody, if you could plunder and get something very rich, it's for your lifetime. So the Polish got really the best things out of it. Kaja Mustafa made the greatest uh, mistake of not counterattacking because the whole, whole Polish troops was useless mm. because of plundering. So if he would have counterattacked, maybe he would have won the battle. As for Kaja Mustafa, his failure was not well received by the Sultan. He was executed the traditional way, strangled with a silk cord and then beheaded. According to some accounts, the head of Kara Mustafa was stolen and brought back to Vienna, where it became an object of amusement in royal court circles. It was used as a football in polo matches, that kind of thing. And there was actually a head kept at this museum until about 10 years ago, allegedly that of Kara Mustafa. But I believe since then it's been buried as more modern sensibilities prevailed. And he's got a rather mournful expression. It's almost as if he had a premonition of his fate. Tough luck. But the legacy of the siege is not confined to museums. It has left its mark everywhere in Vienna, and stories surrounding the battle have come to define the city's character in many ways. One legend claims that while hussars were ransacking the Ottoman encampment, they came across a curious cache, sacks filled with small bean-like pellets. Little did they realize it was coffee. As a result, Vienna opened its first coffee house using the very coffee discovered in the Ottoman encampment. Another legend holds that those baker boys who saved Vienna devised a commemorative cake to celebrate the victory. Designed to mock the Ottoman emblem, the cake was crescent-shaped, thereby giving birth to the croissant. A century later, the novel cake would be introduced to France by the Habsburg princess Marie Antoinette. And the rest is history. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Great. Hmm, jolly good. Well, if local legend is to be believed, the enduring legacy of the Battle of Vienna is the continental breakfast. We have the coffee. Mm. And the croissant. Mm. The Ottoman failure to take Vienna marked a turning point in the fortunes of both Austria and the Ottoman Empire. As the Habsburgs' new capital, Vienna entered an imperial and cultural golden age. While the city celebrated its fortunes with ever more grandiose buildings and monuments, the Ottomans, it seemed, had hit a wall. And for a brief period, Europe seemed united in its determination to rid the continent of the dastardly Turk. In 1686, European forces retook Buddha, and by the beginning of the 18th century, regained most of Hungary. There was awareness within the Ottoman state that they were no longer way ahead of everybody. Maybe they were even falling behind. Maybe their military systems were a bit passé. The pendulum is starting to swing back the other way, and, and so there's a feeling that the Ottoman threat is starting to, to recede. The Ottoman Empire had reached the geographic limits of the expansion. The tables appeared to have turned in Europe's favor, but the conflict was far from over. The Ottomans were still a formidable force. No one, however, could have foreseen the unlikely alliance they would forge with Western Europe in the face of a new menace rising in the east. In the third and last episode, we follow the Ottoman Empire's final centuries 
a period defined by a desperate power struggle with Tsarist Russia. 